We're going to open up with our opening scripture, which will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Um, it'll be hopefully overhead. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but until him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, no, we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we are able to come to your house and worship you, dear Lord. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with the preaching that um, we're hearing this morning and later this evening and that uh, it will just uh, bring glory to you and to your son. Father, we just thank you for all your blessings and just we pray that this hour will be a time where we can give you all the glory and honor and worship you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first two songs we'll be singing today are hopefully a song that you can sing as a personal testimony about because of the, Christ, uh, the fact that Christ has died for you at Calvary. You can sing and rejoice and sing about since Jesus came in your heart. Let's stand and sing that first song, though, number 587 at Calvary. We'll sing the first, third, and fourth stanzas. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. My burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. To Jesus everything, now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. And there was multiplied to me. There, my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And then a couple pages over to number 590, 590 since Jesus came into my heart, there's been a great change. I trust you can sing this out as a personal testimony since Jesus came into my heart. The first, second, and fourth stanzas. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from 
from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, on the fourth as the last, there's a light in the valley of death now for me, since Jesus came into my heart. And the gates of the city beyond I can see, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. You may be seated as Brother Jerry Carrier comes to minister in song. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and a grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more hath dominion for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and a grace. Amen. Well, I pray that 
that you have truly turned your eyes to Jesus, and if that is your testimony and Jesus has come into your heart, the love of Christ is constraining you to live a life for him, not for self, keeping you from a life of sin, as the Apostle Paul wrote in our scripture reading this morning, 2 Corinthians. So if you turn to your Blue Wild songbooks, we'll sing number 162, Constrained by Christ, all three verses as you remain seated. hope you've had a good week and that as you're here today, whatever burdens you have weighing on you that have accumulated or maybe been heightened during the week that we can cast on the Lord and just be nourished, guided, corrected, and helped by his word today. I want to encourage you to, even if you're not a regular Sunday night attender, come out this evening as we continue to talk about the church and culture Pastor John Minion of Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church in Fort Wayne will be with us. This is a man whose heart and voice and ministry and message you just have to be here for, and I know you'll benefit from it, so I pray and hope that you'll uh, make an effort if you're able. Come out at 6 o'clock this evening. And then next Sunday, we're glad we're going to be able to have um, our missionary to France, J.J. Shaluchenko and his uh, wife and daughter will be with us, and so we'll start with a combined Sunday school over in Grace Place and then uh, hear from him in the morning message about what God is doing in France and a challenge from the word as well. Um, if you are able to house the Sheluchenkos for part or all of the week that they'll be here in town, you can see details back on the bulletin board. This summer, we've been working through divine diagnoses, letters to the seven churches. If you could open your Bible one more time to those first three chapters of the book of Revelation. And we have already been through each of the, we spent one week on each of those seven letters. So as you open, you'll notice there's not an eighth letter. We are coming back to this section of scripture for what you maybe saw in your bulletin. The message title is the letter to the church in Indianapolis. What we want to do is take from this 
uh, section, all seven of these letters, what are the lessons that these churches are given in combination that we are to learn from? And though Indianapolis is not mentioned in your scriptures, had one lady looked at that bulletin this morning and says, I don't think I remember seeing that section of the Bible, but I want to encourage you that this is a legitimate application. This is actually the intended application of this section of Scripture. I want you to notice, for example, in chapter 2 and verse 23, if you look at the second line of that verse, we're told specifically that the judgment that comes against the believers in Thyatira was so that all the churches could know that Jesus is the one that searches men's hearts. Furthermore, at the end of each of these letters, we're told that the content of the letter is for anyone who has an ear to hear so that we might learn from it. So I want you to look, here's a map of modern day Turkey and highlighted on this map are the different points where these cities stand or stood or maybe ruins of these cities are today. And it started in the uh, southwestern uh, part of this map at Ephesus is where we started the series. And then we go north, counter, or, or we go clockwise to Smyrna, to Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and ending in Laodicea. This is the way the letters are ordered in scripture. And it actually follows a, an ancient postal route. And it really comes full circle both geographically and uh, metaphorically in terms of what is encompassed in these letters to these churches. These are real churches of first century Asia Minor. They're not the only churches that were around. And yet the Holy Spirit selected these seven as a, a, a representative, a kind of a sufficient sampling wherein we see, and seven is a number of completion biblically, we see a complete picture all the way from some very healthy churches where nothing is even condemned to some very unhealthy churches where nothing is even commended and everything in between with most churches being an admixture of strengths and weaknesses. And the purpose of this complete picture, this full picture, the picture this full circle picture, this seven fold picture is so that we uh, in the church age might look to this and learn about what Jesus is looking for in his churches. And that is our goal, to please Christ our head and to function as a healthy church. And so this morning, I want us to start together by rereading this full section. And I understand this is going to take about a third to a half of the message time, and this is very out of the ordinary for us. But there could hardly be a more crucial and captivating section of Scripture. Obviously, it's all good, equally authoritative, inerrant, and inspired. But how necessary, how important this is for us. We've really got to make sure before we move on to this and after other side of the Chelichenko's presentation, come back to our book of Ephesians to make sure we have a good, as best grasp as we can of this section of Scripture. So as I read through it, and this is kind of lengthy, please don't tune out for this. Pay closer attention to the reading of Scripture than you do to anything else uh, that, that any of us have to say this morning, please. So I'll read without interruption or comment, substituting just a couple of words where necessary for reverence or clarity, starting in Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant, his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches where it are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood 
and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hairs were like white like wool, and his as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Unto the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, 
because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I, thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, that the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest to tolerate that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the minds and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, and keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore what thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. As God's people, we all say, Amen. Thank you. So important as we gather together that we come to hear the voice of God. In our busy lives, with schedules so filled our minds so crammed with information and details, our eyes so filled with media, our lives so stuffed with activity. It's so important that we stop and gather and listen and hear God's voice through his word. When we open scripture, this is the voice of God. This is God, our Father, speaking to us. And yet, at the start of each letter, who is identified as the one who is speaking? At the start of each letter, Jesus Christ is said to be the one speaking. And yet, at the end of each letter, who is the one who is said to have been speaking in the letter? At the end of each letter, the Holy Spirit is said to have been speaking. And this is not a contradiction. It is a triune, complementary completion where in the ancient scriptures, God the Father is speaking through the Son, by the Spirit, to us today. Hear the voice of God. And this is a major theme of these first three chapters. Did you notice in chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Hey, you've already got a blessing this morning. Reading through those three chapters was not just an exercise or a time filler. No, this was a blessed proclamation, recitation of God's inspired truth for us to hear. Look at verse one, uh, verse 10 of chapter 1, John says, On the Lord's day he heard behind him a great voice like a trumpet. Verse 12, he turned to see the voice. Isn't that interesting? In verse 15, he describes this voice that he heard as a voice like the roar of many waters. Verse 16 indicates that coming out of his mouth, his words are like a sword. So is this a mixed metaphor? Do we hear this voice or do we see it? Is it like a trumpet? Is it like the waters or is it like the blade of a sword? And the answer is yes. Yes, God's word is complex and complete, though simple and accessible to us in its plain truths. Like a trumpet, his voice is piercing, calling us to action. Like the waters, his voice is infinitely deep and immersive, drowning our doubts and quenching our soul's thirst. Like a sword, his voice is sharp and penetrating, 
discerning, and authoritative, we must hear this voice. At the end of each letter, once again, we have those words, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Chapter 3 and verse 3, Sardis is told to remember what they have received and heard. And finally, toward the end in chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus stands at the door and knocks and says, If anyone hears my voice, let him open and I will come in. So important that we hear the voice of God. He speaks to us through his word. Are you listening? Are you too busy for this voice? Are you too bored by this voice? That your full eyes, your full mind, your full schedule cannot hear the voice of God. Study the scriptures daily. Come to church to hear what God says. Number two, we see in these three chapters that we are, as a church, if we are to be healthy, we must submit to the headship of Christ. Notice the authority of Jesus over the churches as he is the one who, who walks among those lampstands. He is the one who holds those stars that are the messengers and he appoints whether a church shines for him with a lampstand or whether and when that lampstand is removed. It all is judged by his standard of what is to be and what is not to be in a healthy church. Do you care about this? This is our criteria. This is what we ought to build our lives and our church around as surrendered, submissive followers to our head, Jesus Christ. He walks among the lampstands. He holds the messengers in his hand. He has the authority to correct and to commend. Coming to church, we read in Revelation 1 through 3, doesn't appear to be so much about what I should expect to get from Christ. But what we see instead in these three chapters is that in the church, Christ has significant expectations from us. Many come to church because they want something from Jesus. And Jesus has much to give. And Jesus delights to give. Thank the Lord for his grace. But Jesus is not beholden to the church. We are beholden to him. Let it never be our expectation that he would adjust his ministry to give to us those things that we desire, but instead that we would adjust our ministry so that we might give to him everything that he desires and describes and deserves and demands. Number three, uphold the ministry of his messengers and the angel of this church and the angel of that church. We've compared some scriptures that indicate likely what's being referred to here is the, not the angelic heavenly messenger, but a earthly human messenger, likely the pastors in these cases that are responsible to deliver the message to the church. And really that's all the messenger is, is a messenger. And so by uphold that ministry, what I have primarily intended is that you would be willing to pray for the messengers, either that God has appointed in this church or that God brings to this church. Uh, tonight we'll hear from a messenger. This morning you have one messenger. Last week a different messenger. Next week another messenger. And specifically for you know, a messenger, it seems this is a messenger that's appointed to this location, to this church body, to give God's messages to them. Pray for the pastors of your church. And please, would you commit, if you're not already doing this, to pray for Pastor Jeremy, to pray for Pastor Sluis, to pray for myself, to pray for us daily? If you care about the health of your church, would you pray for, would you uphold in prayer the messengers of the church? Some of you do that and it means so much and we thank you for that and count on that and rely on that. At the end of the day, we're just here to give the message though. So the other way you uphold the messenger is to hold them to a standard of whether or not the message is what is being messaged 
so that when you come, you are not hearing somebody's thoughts or philosophies or political views, so those, those will sometime come out by way of insight in form of application. We are coming primarily just to directly hear from God his messages. And so as you find yourself in a situation in life where you are looking for a church or where you are looking as a church for a pastor, insist that a pastor preach God's word, make expository preaching central to the ministry so that you can faithfully hear the message of God. If you don't know what that word expository means, expository preaching simply exposes what is in the scripture, does not read into it one's own ideas, does not twist it to use something that the original author and the divine spirit did not intend, but merely walks through scripture showing exactly what it says in a way that you could look back afterwards and say, yes, everything that was said, I see it in scripture. And if I had spent that time studying, would find those same interpretations and insights that's been exposed to me. Number four, pursue the health of our church. Make this, well, each of these ought to be part, this is your, what's on your plate, your shoulders. These are responsibilities that God is giving to the church. Don't shirk this. Don't count on someone else to do this. You are to pursue the health of our church. And understand when I say our church, we know it is Christ's church. It is God's church. But when we talk about this local body, you are to be concerned with and invested in our health as a body. The messenger is only responsible to give the message. And that's one thing I really want you to notice in these letters. It's not, now tell the messenger that he needs to fix this and tell the messenger that he ought to address that situation. No, it's tell the messenger to give the message to the church that the church is to address this and is doing this which they shouldn't be doing and is not doing that which they should have been doing and is doing that which they're doing a great job doing. It's the whole church that's responsible to receive the word of God, respond to it by implementing it in these prescribed ways ways so that we can thrive as a healthy church. It is not the messenger's responsibility. It is yours and yours and yours and mine as a fellow member of this body. It's for he who has an ear to hear. It's for if any man hear my voice, all of us individually, corporately come together and contribute to the health of the church. So number five, embrace your role as an individual believer. And number four is about our corporate pursuit of health. But I want to pause on this final point to encourage us to take individual ownership and responsibility for our roles. And in some of the letters, there are individuals that are highlighted. Antipas, who gave his life as a martyr, is mentioned by name. In other church contexts, there are False teachers condemned by name, individuals such as Jezebel or the Nicolaitans or those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. There is an individual responsibility that if we are to function as a healthy faith family, a healthy church body, a healthy New Testament organism built on our foundation of Christ, growing up into him as our head, that each one of us is crucial, our spiritual health is crucial to the health of the church. Can you embrace that? The idea that it's not, there's no such thing as a healthy church that's made up of unhealthy members. Okay, you know, we're talking spiritually. There's no spiritually healthy church that's filled with spiritually unhealthy members. As you as an individual pursue, pursue spiritual health and faithfully contribute to this church is spiritual health. That's how we, we thrive and are healthy before God. But by God's grace, through his strength, we follow what he has given on an individual level. Let me ask you, when someone asks you how you're doing, how's your health? How many components of your body have to be not doing great before your answer to that is, well, I'm not very healthy at all? Uh, at some stages in your life, maybe you wake up feeling like a million bucks. You know what that's like? There are other stages in life where you wake up feeling like the national deficit. Some of you know what that's like. 
And so if your right knee is bad and your left shoulder is dodgy and your eye is oozing pus and your lungs just aren't that great and someone asks you how you're doing, are you healthy, you know, it doesn't take very many components of the body being out of alignment before you have to say, I'm really not healthy right now. So it is with the church. We are instructed that we are one body and members in particular. And if you are not pursuing God, if you are not pursuing right doctrine, or if you are not pursuing holy lifestyle, if you are not pursuing the works of love and faith and patience and grace as you minister to one another and shine the light of our lampstand to those in our community, then we won't thrive as a healthy church until we have healthy members. Even in some of these letters, even where a few remain faithful, Hey, don't say, well, our church can never thrive until so-and-so gets his act together. No. Where a few remain faithful and have not defiled their garments, the scripture tells us, the Lord holds out hope for that ministry and those ones ought to have an increased influence. I want to close by drawing from these letters. I say close, but we have several minutes left, so just uh, let's take inventory and we're going to go through and we've just collect each week we've looked at the the different diagnoses that have been given what the lord says about the condition spiritually the health of that ministry we've looked at a prognosis what the lord says will happen if one action is taken and what else will happen if no action is taken then we've looked at prescription what needs to be done in order to receive god's blessing and function in spiritual health and so I have just collected all of those, and we want to start with the, we'll look at the unhealthy ones, what the Lord says we ought to do about that, and what will happen if we don't. And then we'll look at the healthy ones, and this, we ought to be very interested in this. Because this, you know, when you go looking for a church, you have some things that you're, you're looking for, some boxes you want to check. When Jesus looks at a church, what is he looking for? What turns him off? What pleases him? What disgraces him? What displays him? So here are the unhealthy traits, and these are just drawn straight from these letters. This is not my analysis of what a healthy church is or isn't. Now, I've used words that kind of summarize lengthier descriptions, but these are all drawn directly from the letters. The unhealthy traits include an abandoned first love, toleration of idolatrous Compromise, toleration of sexual immorality, toleration of an unrepentant influencer who's allowed to have a voice in the church. Not only toleration of sexual immorality, but in one church there was participation in sexual immorality. In one church, the unhealthy trait is diagnosed as deadness. For others, incomplete works lukewarmness, pride and complacency, and then spiritual wretchedness, poverty, blindness, and nakedness. These things represent what are threats to our health in 21st century Indianapolis church. Things we are to be on guard against, things that are not to be tolerated or practiced or harbored in our church. Things that we are to search our hearts for. Lord, am I lukewarm? Have I grown complacent? Am I so proud I think there is nothing needs to be corrected in my life or church? Yet isn't it enlightening to see that in this rap sheet, this harsh and deadly and very cringy diagnosis, that the Lord holds out hope. He gives a prescription for that. Even in Sardis, hey, you're dead, I've got a prescription for that. What mercy, what long suffering of Jesus. So he gives us these warning prescriptions. It's not, well, I'm okay with that, don't worry about it, I still like you. No, it's here's some warning prescriptions. The, the most common is repent. At the end of every letter where something is condemned, there is this prescription, repent. And in one of them where it's gotten so bad that it says, be zealous and repent. Repentance ought to be a regular part of our practice as individuals and as a church to identify sin and to turn from it. Remember where you fell from. 
Do your first works. Remember what you received and heard. And to one church, he says, wake up. And could it be that we as a church or that some within our church need to take this kind of action? Because if we don't, here are the negative prognoses. What will happen if these prescriptions are not followed? One, these are just taken right from scripture to one church. Jesus says, I will come and remove your lampstand. The church can continue to have the lights on and have gatherings and have Jesus' name in their literatures and on their church sign, but he's not there. Jesus will war against you. You will face great tribulation. You will suffer severe consequence. To one church, he warns that his coming will catch them off guard or that Jesus will spew you out from fellowship with him, communion with him in in acceptable service. You will be reproved and disciplined, he tells to the churches that are out of line. If we're not sure of our spiritual health, these things sure ought to get our attention. We don't want this for our church, for any individual here. So our first concern for you is, do you know the Lord? Do you have a relationship with God through Christ? Have your sins been forgiven? And do you have a biblical basis for your answer to that question? If you were to stand before God today, to know that your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven and that you are part of his family and have an eternal home with him, that you've been reborn. If you're not sure about that, please see one of us after service. This is the time. And aren't you glad as you look at these lists that this isn't all the book tells us? It's not as though Jesus simply looks at his churches and criticizes and corrects and condemns and casts aside. Isn't it hopeful to know that Jesus claims and loves and ministers to churches with problems such as these? Praise God for his grace. Make sure you're part of a healthy church and strive to be a healthy church member But I want to warn you against the mentality that says, well, if there's one, two, three, a couple things in this church that aren't to my liking, that don't suit my settled tastes, that kind of ruffle my feathers or rub me the wrong way, I think I'll just move on because that's not Jesus' mentality. Jesus looks at churches with severe problems and says, let's work on those. I want to be part of the solution. I want to be central to this church coming to health where it's unhealthy and thriving in health where it is healthy. Let's have a patient committedness to invest in this flawed body, not to ignore problems, but where problems come up, rather than running from them to address them. And you can help us come to health. If there's a heart for growth, if there's a heart for faithfulness, our Lord is very patient and gracious to bless that. So let's look at the healthy traits. This is what Jesus is looking for, what he commends in his church. Things such as great works, toil, and patience. Jesus sees that. Doctrinal integrity comes up early and often. A little strength. Jesus commends that. That's not a criticism. Sometimes we feel our numbers are small or our influence is insignificant, not the footprint and the impact that we'd like to have. And the Lord says, if you have a little strength, I'll give you an open door. An abhorrence of evil works. There are things that we ought to hate and abstain from. Perseverance under intense pressure. Another that comes up early and often. You'll see it on this list worded in different ways. Spiritual wealth despite physical poverty. Don't have to have a lot of money or a big operating budget to be a healthy church. In fact, it seems the healthiest of these seven are the smallest and poorest in physical terms. Nothing holy about being small, nothing holy about uh, being out of money. Nor is there anything sinful about being a large church or sinful about having a big operating budget. A lot of uh, wealthy members. 
Spiritual health doesn't depend on these things, and these letters illustrate that for us. Steadfastness, when opposed by slanderers, is commended by Christ. Endurance in heightened spiritual warfare. You can be where Satan's seed is, and Jesus sees that. Firmness in holding fast Christ's name, so important to him. Love, faith, service, exceeding works, adherence to Christ's word, and faithfulness under pressure. I've even condensed this list and combined some points that Jesus uh, commended churches for. And I want to leave that up for a second. You can see I'd even move the title aside to make room for all of these things. Where at some point in this message series, as we work through seven letters, did you get a little bit weighed down with five of these churches just having such significant problems that it seemed that their very testimony and continuance was under threat and there are these these real problems that really need to be addressed and we could almost walk away and go wow the church is in in such a hard uh, position and difficult condition and 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 how are we going to survive but look at these seven churches and the the commendation from christ actually is a longer list than the condemnation doesn't mean he doesn't see or care about the problems, but Jesus is not just looking for problems. He is pleased by our faithfulness. And so he gives encouraging prescriptions to those churches where these things are present. He says, don't suffer, don't be afraid to suffer for the faith. That might not sound like an encouraging prescription, but suffering is coming, so the encouragement is don't be afraid. Have courage. Christ sees he is with you through that. Be faithful unto death. Again, these are encouraging prescriptions. Yes, he sees this faithfulness. And if we are faithful and death is the worst we have to fear, that's a much better position than Christ's judgment being what we have to fear. Would you rather everything's going fine in your life except that Jesus disapproves and opposes? Or would you prefer that everything's going poorly in your life except that Jesus sustains and comforts? And it's not that those are the only two options, but which is more important? Hold fast. This one comes up multiple times. I've just got it once on the list. Strengthen what remains. Find the good and build it up. Invest in heavenly wealth, apparel, and vision. And then it's not given as an imperative, but in a promise form for those who overcome. And this in every letter, a promise for those who are faithful, for those who are overcome, the expectation that in each of these bodies, there will be those, if you are a true believer, you will overcome and experience to varying degrees these blessings promised at the end of each of these letters. And the blessings are these, the po po positive prognoses. Christ gives an open door. You will face increased persecution, and that is positive. The Bible tells us that all who live godly will suffer persecution. And I put it on this list because it's in the context of Jesus commending and saying this is, a good th this is what will happen to those who are faithful. I see it, I know it, I'm with you through it. And we even see people in the Bible when they face that persecution rejoicing because this is a positive prognosis. Because, number three, you're immunized against the second death. You will be nourished and cherished by Christ in those difficult times and in the life to come. You will participate in heavenly rulership and to have the morning star is to have the heavenly ruler himself. You will receive the heavenly ruler. You will commune with Christ. You will be affirmed and secured by Christ and in his book of life. Christ will vindicate you in love before those who have persecuted you. You will be kept from the great tribulation. You will receive personal blessing rooted in eternal home. You will reign with Christ on his throne as he has reigned with the Father on his throne. What wonderful blessings. What precious promises are ours if we are faithful to overcome. What great realities are at stake. What powerful motivation to be faithful. And friends, as we come away from this, with this filling our hearts, our minds, and our ears, as we hear the voice of God through this, don't you want to be faithful 
Don't you want Thompson Row Baptist Church to be faithful? Don't you want Christ to look at us and walk in our midst and our lampstand to shine brightly for him, even if it's not always in the form or in the influence that, that we might hope, that we would be seen as faithful? Aren't you thankful for the Lord's faithfulness to us, even when we fall short? And could you pray this? Could we pray this as a group? May God show us those areas where we need to change. May it be clear to us where we are falling short, where we have gone astray, where we are tolerating what we should not, or something is absent that ought to be there. May God show these things to us and burden our hearts for this. And then may God encourage us where we are strong, where we are doing what we ought to do, and somehow growing weary in that doing that he would give us eagle's wings to continue. So our prayer is that Thompson Road Baptist Church would hold fast, would overcome, would stand firm and be faithful until Christ's return. Let's just be faithful. We want to close with just the chorus that is a prayer. As our instruments come, may the Lord find us faithful. I think you know this one well enough to at least just sing that chorus. Would you sing this from your heart? Would you make this a prayer individually and as a church? Uh, let's pray this even as we sing it. Standing together if you would. May the Lord find us If we can be of spiritual help to you or just have a prayer need that we can go over with you in any way, uh, please see anyone that you saw on the platform today after the service or back at the Welcome Center, and we'd love to connect with you. Again, do hope you'll be back this evening and uh, or to look forward to next Sunday. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we dismiss in prayer. Heavenly Father, we submit ourselves to you just with our our heart's door open so that you may examine, so that you may uh, diagnose and prescribe, and Lord, help us to be faithful to follow. Lord, individually, as spiritual battles await us this week, give us strength, clad us in your armor, and don't lead us into temptation. Lord, as we deal with things that have already come up and maybe gained footing or rooted themselves in our lives as poor patterns or sinful behaviors. Lord, give us the grace, the vision to see that and to repent by your spirit in us. And Lord, help us to hold fast to what is right so that we can thrive as a healthy church for God's glory. In Jesus' name, amen.